well. Uh, so tonight, uh, we have the, the great honor and privilege to, to hear from uh, perhaps one of the best informed people about uh, a particular uh, issue that has great consequence for all of us, and that's, that's net neutrality. Uh, and I have several objectives tonight in the course of this conversation. Um, one is I, I want us to learn a little bit about uh, our guest tonight, uh, Chairman Tom Wheeler, who has a distinguished background uh, in representing um, important segments of the American economy, um, uh, wireless communications and, and the cable um, industry, uh, before uh, taking on the role of the chairman of the, the Federal Communications Commission. So I, wanna, I want us to learn a little bit about uh, Chairman Wheeler. Uh, then I want us to learn a little bit about um, the, the landscape of net neutrality. What, what, who are the players and what are the, uh, what are the issues at play there? before we then dive into exactly what is, is net neutrality and what's changed. Um, and so hopefully throughout the course of that, you, you learn some things about this, uh, this dynamic and changing world, um, and then hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll understand how, how it impacts you. So let, let's talk about public service. So you've had a distinguished career in a lot of different roles. Um, obviously, most recently as the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, and we'll get to that. Um, and you've started some businesses, run some businesses, but your, your principal at uh, the time of your career was as a lobbyist, mm -hmm. um, and, and you lobbied for, for two mm -hmm. principal industry associations. What caused you to pursue that career path? What, what drew you to lobbying? I was an intern, I got involved in campaigns, um, and one thing led to another, and uh, uh, I, I worked for Jack Gilligan in the 1968 mm -hmm. Senate campaign, mm -hmm. and uh, which he lost. And but Jack was good enough to make a call to uh, a fellow over here by the name of George Cook, um, who was running the grocery manufacturers of America. And George hired me, and I came to Washington because I had Potomac fever in a bad way. And I was lucky enough, multiple years after that, that Mike DeSalle former governor of Ohio, who, again, I had met through the John Glenn campaign um, and had become a mentor of mine, that the National Cable Television Association was looking for a number two. And, um, and the guy who had just come in as the number one uh, asked his friend Mike DeSalle, and DeSalle says, we got to look at Wheeler. And so I ended up in the cable television business in the mid-70s, when cable television was nothing like what we know today. And, um, and what was interesting about that point in time was that cable was, um, was growing out of rural communities. It had, it had started um, down in the valleys where you couldn't get any kind of a broadcast signal and so, so that you would run a cable down to, to connect everybody. And it was starting to come out um, into more populated areas and the broadcasters didn't like this. Uh, this was new competition. And, um, and so they went to the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, and were successful in convincing the FCC um, that restrictions ought to be put on the signals, the, the programs that the cable operators could be used so they wouldn't be too attractive. At the same point in time, the telephone company didn't like the idea that um, there was a second wire into the home. Excuse me, that's our business. And so we spent our time in the nascent days of the cable industry fighting the broadcasters and the telephone companies for the right to be able to compete with them. And, um, and uh, those, were great, those were great days. Um, and they were also the days that the cable industry took off. Um, and suddenly, you know, MTV was born, HBO, CNN, everything we take for granted uh, today. It was a fabulous time uh, to be around and to be advocating for something that brought competition and innovation to the market. Um, and then after a whole series of other things, then I went out to, quote, make my fortune 
in the, uh, in the cable business uh, uh, and start some companies, some of which worked, many of which didn't. Um, and, uh, and I ended up um, winning, being part of a group that won a Spectrum license for this new thing called cellular telephone. And the license was over in Fort Wayne, Indiana, or just, just west of, of Fort Wayne, Indiana. And, um, and suddenly I was in this cellular business, and one thing led to another, and I became the president of the Cellular Industry Association. And the cellular industry was in exactly the same kind of situation, where we were the insurgents challenging the incumbents, the telephone companies. And so we were having to fight at the FCC, and in Congress for policies that would allow us to bring new competition uh, into the space. Now, today the cable industry is far from the small groups that, that I worked with, small industry I worked with, as is the wireless industry. They've grown to be highly successful and begin to exhibit some of the same characteristics that I fought on their behalf lo those many years ago. And so I found myself at the FCC trying to bring the same kind of philosophy that I had practiced uh, with them uh, into my daily activities in the policy making um, so pa uh, yeah. pause in your personal journey here, and thank you for sharing that. And I want to come back to lobbying in a minute. But tell us, yeah. tell us, what does the FCC do? What is the FCC's job? Well, the FCC um, regulates the nation's networks, and uh, that means that it has responsibility for about one-sixth of the economy, one-sixth of the GDP. But the interesting thing about that job is that the other five-sixths rely on those networks. The telephone networks, the cable networks, the broadcast networks, the internet, the satellite networks, all of these networks, all of the way that we connect as a society and an economy uh, is overseen by the FCC. Um, it also has a very interesting role that is not as uh, uh, well known, um, where it is an independent agency that has tax and spend authority. Mm -hmm. So on every one of your phone bills, um, you see a little line item there, which is FCC fees. And um, we decide what those are going to be um, and, um, and raise Last year I was there, we raised about $10 billion. And we use that money to support the delivery of services in high cost areas where, um, where uh, the, the traditional economics is principally rural areas where it's really expensive to build and maintain plant when you only have you know, a customer, you know, every couple of miles. Um, and then we use that to support low-income uh, Americans. Um, and one of the things that I did while I was there was we broadened it to make sure that we were providing support for low-income Americans to have access to the Internet because how can you exist today if you can't connect to the Internet? Quick factoid, 70% of America's students uh, are given homework assignments that, um, that they have to do on the internet or they require them to use the internet. And, um, and, and, and if you are from a home that can't afford internet access, um, you're in a real competitive disadvantage where literally students were going to McDonald's to get the Wi-Fi. Wi yeah. um, and then the other thing that we did was to support um, uh, the connection of schools and libraries to the Internet. When I came to the commission, um, only one-third of the schools in America 
had a high-speed fiber connection. And of that third, only half of them had Wi-Fi to the desk. When I left, 90% of all the school campuses in America had high-speed connectivity to the student's desk. Because how can you get educated these yeah. days if yeah. you can't get on the internet? So that's a, it's, a, it's a very diverse portfolio. Yeah. It's a terrific agency. Activities afterwards. Okay, so you mentioned the word network. Let's talk about net neutrality. Um, paint, the, paint the landscape for us. As you walked into your role in the FCC, um, what, what were your aspirations around um, the internet? What, what did you see as, as something that needed to be fixed or status quo looked good to you and let's take steps <coughs> to maintain it? So, so um, you know, the internet is, uh, it's, it's, it, is it changes everything uh, it, it, it has touched. Um, and the reality of the internet is that we found two-thirds of American households had either zero or one choice to get internet service. Two-thirds of the American households had at most one choice. So the delivery of internet is a local monopoly. And some of the cable companies and telephone companies that were offering internet service had shown they were not unwilling to use that monopoly to advantage themselves, to favor their product, to discourage others. Um, and, um, and so my predecessor, so, so Barack Obama um, campaigned on we want to have net neutrality. And net neutrality is a, is a, is a very basic concept that the, net, the, the, the network of the 21st century ought to be open, that there shouldn't be gatekeepers that decide, well, you get in, you don't, you get charged extra, you get a fast lane, you get a slow lane, no. That there is an open pathway for everybody. Who's the everybody? So the, the three that you've sort of right. suggested are consumers, those of us in the room who receive right. information the producers of content, right. and then those who manage the grid, those who invest in the, the yeah, I mean, you want Yeah, you want to make sure that, um, that, that there is what I used to call permissionless innovation. One of the things that the internet has allowed is this incredible upsurge, and I don't care whether it's Google, Facebook, or the ability to connect those school students that we were talking about before that has changed the way in which um, uh, uh, classes are taught and, and students learn. Um, all of that gets changed. And, um, and so anybody who uses the, who delivers uh, product or consumes product um, are those who ought to have open access to that pipe that, that delivers it. And my predecessor in the first, so I, I was chairman for the second half of, of the Obama administration for the last four years. <coughs> and um, my predecessor had dealt with this issue in 2010 and, um, and, uh, and had been vehemently opposed by the network owners. And when he came out with his open internet rule, Verizon appealed that decision to the court because every decision the FCC makes is an appealable decision mm -hmm. to the court system. And um, 
I was in office for about two months when the phone rang one day and the court had handed down its decision and they had thrown out the previous rules. And so I had to decide how we were going to repackage um, and accomplish this important goal of having a fast, fair, and open internet. And that, um, that was, a, uh, was, a, was a fascinating experience um, where you have on one side all of those who were the advocates for uh, the use of the network, mm -hmm. and on the other side you have a handful of very powerful companies who want to be able to exercise the position that they are in, as I said, typically the monopoly providers in a community. And, um, and uh, we ended up siding with, uh, with uh, the open internet uh, and got sued again. This time we won. And a matter of fact, we won twice. And, um, and so when we left office, um, open internet rules were in place. And unfortunately, uh, my successor, the, the Trump FCC, was rules. So, so unpack that a little bit. Talk us through the trade-offs, and then we'll start to open it up to your questions. So on the face of it, who would oppose the fast, fair, and open internet? Like, that sounds like something mom and apple pie-ish, right? Why wouldn't we want that? So what's the argument against a fast, open, and fair internet? Well, the principal argument that gets used is, oh, we won't be able to invest as much as, um, as we otherwise would if this is going to be something that's going to be regulated. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, from my years um, as a lobbyist, back to your first question, um, I made those arguments myself at one point in time. <laughs> they are the traditional fallback. Um, and the fascinating thing is, and so that was the basic of, oh my golly, we've got to have, we've got to have, make all this investment in broadband that's necessary to make it faster and to get it into rural areas and, and all of this sort of thing. And, and we just won't be able to do it. Well, the fact of the matter is that after we put our rules in place, broadband investment continued to grow. And here's the amazing thing. After we put our rules in place, broadband investment grew. Um, the number of companies who were being backed with venture capital to deliver new services, new and innovative services on the internet grew. The revenue generated by selling broadband services to these network companies grew because people were using the internet more. And the company's profits soared and their stock prices went to all time highs. This for the thing that was supposed to destroy their ability to invest and, and cut away at, their, at the end so of the So why would it have, been, if, if in the world they envisioned, mm -hmm. it would have cramped their ability to invest, in what way would it have cramped their ability to invest? What specifically did they fear about the FCC's rulemaking authority? Well, so, so for instance, if you have the ability to say, um, I want to charge extra, think about your cable company, your cable system. If you want to cableize the internet, congratulations, Trevor, I'm really glad that you want Facebook. Facebook is on this tier, and you're going to pay extra for, for that tier. Um, or um, uh, I, I know that you want this new video service that's being um, delivered. Uh, that's going to cost you this extra. Or we can deliver it to you slower that, so the picture quality won't be as good and you'll have that buffering every once in a while. But if you want it uh, in a fast lane, or you turn to Netflix and you say, hey, Netflix, um, if you want to... Um, if you want to reach Trevor in the best possible way, you pay me a bonus and I'll make sure that your bits get treated uh, uh, especially. 
And, um, and, and it, it was that kind of ability to take an essential service um, and, uh, and turn its usage into ways that specifically maximized profits by, hold, by, by, by constraining capabilities that had been demonstrated before and we wanted to make sure it didn't happen again. But so their argument would be under those circumstances, the Comcast, the AT&Ts, mm -hmm. would see a better return and hence that would spur them to make greater investments because they would see some better profit margin under this arrangement where they could tier. Right? That was the argument. But the reality is that you should, only, you know, as, as a former businessman, you should only make an investment when you get a return. You do not make an investment based on, well, what's the regulatory situation mm -hmm. here? It's can because that I, would change. Exactly. Can I get a return? That's the basis on which you yeah. make an investment. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, and, and as, as I said, and, you know, the investment has been at record level since then. Yeah. Questions from the audience. Let's start, start that process. Um, so you mentioned that many Americans only have access to essentially like one internet provider. Right. Is there any kind of way to alleviate this issue or like create more competition in these kind of environments? Um, the, um, the answer is I wish there were more. One of the things that we did um, every time somebody would come to us for some kind of merger approval, like when, uh, when AT&T wanted to buy DirecTV, we said, okay, um, you got some conditions on how, how you can operate it to make sure that things stay competitive, but also we want you to expand your fiber put footprint by 40% by overbuilding which is the term, overbuilding places where there are monopoly providers and giving consumers choice. Um, we did the same thing when Charter wanted to acquire uh, Time Warner Cable. All of you in Columbus, you now are Charter subscribers or Spectrum subscribers instead of Time Warner Cable uh, subscribers. And we required them to overbuild as well. But unfortunately, when the Trump FCC came in, they immediately reverse that, and they don't have to have to, to overbuild competition. We tried to encourage new providers. The biggest you know, uh, effort at that was Google, which had their own Google Fiber project. And I know this will absolutely shock you, but when Google would announce that they were coming into, let's say, Austin, Texas, uh, AT&T, who happens to be providing broadband in Austin, immediately expanded their capacity and lowered their prices. I know it's a shocking thought that competition would do something like that. Um, but Google was never successful in, uh, in doing this because um, they had difficulty, if you can believe it, getting um, access to the utility poles so they could run the fiber because that was controlled by guess who. And um, they uh, had difficulties um, getting content uh, for the cable side of the business. The last thing, and Regina will remember this, on the day that, the last alternative uh, that we tried, uh, on the same day that we passed the open internet rule, we also preempted state legislatures, state laws, that had said that local governments couldn't build a broadband network. There are 19 states where the cable and phone companies have used their muscle in the legislature to get the legislature to enact laws saying that municipalities may not build a competitive fiber network. And I thought, my golly, if the people are dissatisfied with their service that they're getting and go to their government, their local government, and say, will you build a competitive alternative, that they ought to have the right to do that. But of course, the companies didn't like the competition. 
we passed a rule preempting a couple of states as kind of models for this, preempting those, those states. Surprise, the network took us to court and the court ruled that we didn't have the authority, that we had, we had uh, overreached our authority. But those were the kinds of, we, we, the answer, so the answer to your question was yes, we were constantly trying to figure out how can we force new competition uh, into the market and we're constantly being thwarted by those who didn't want it. So I want to reach back to your, your lobbying background. So one of the fears that some, uh, particularly on the consumer advocacy side, had when you came into this role is you had been representing the industries that you would now be, be right. regulating. And right. clearly, just listening to you talk, that experience gives you a wealth of knowledge about, about the industry. But how did you overcome that sense of, oh, I, I'm tied to those industries, I was an advocate for those industries, to then take on the role of serving the public interest and trying to balance the interests of the industries, the interests of the incumbent yeah, industry, yeah. the insurgents, yeah. and the consumers writ large. How do you how do you do that? Well, I'm mean, so so. First is remember that when I was representing cable and wireless, they were the insurgents. They were the ones bringing competition. We were fighting to be able. They were the Davids to compete. and there were Goliaths. Yes, exactly. Um, and then, you know, so I was asked this question in my Senate confirmation hearing. Uh, Dan Coates, who was the, the, Senator, the, from the Senator from Indiana, my current, home state, current, current head of, uh, of, uh, of intelligence, uh, director of intelligence, national intelligence, um, asked me this question. He says, you know, so you represented the industry, and how do we know that you're going to not be their shill? There are a lot of people who... Yeah. as you suggested, so you think that you'll be their shill. And, um, and I said to him, I said, Senator, you know, when I was representing those industries, um, I hope that I was a good advocate for my client. Um, and I did the best possible to advocate in their behalf. But now my client's going to be the American people, mm -hmm. and I intend to be the best advocate the American people can have. Did you get his vote? Uh, yes. Good I job. Did. Good. Another question from the audience. We'll go here and then there. When you talk about the reversal of net neutrality, what kind of impact do you think that's going to have on economic growth and particularly small startup businesses yes. that use the internet as a distribution tool? Yeah. It's a great question. Um, first of all, I, 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 I'm hopeful that 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 the Trump FCC has also been challenged in court and that the court will see the, uh, the, 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 the error in their ways and will reverse what they've decided. So, uh, so I'm not ready to jump off the bridge yet uh, and say that, that, that we're, we're at doom and gloom because I do have faith in the judicial review process. But having said that, um, I, I think what you are going to see um, is, first of all, um, these companies um, are not fools, and they won't start increasing rates the following week, for instance. Um, but you'll see something that is kind of like boiling a frog. You know the story about how you boil a frog? You know, you don't take a frog and plunk him into a pot of boiling water because boom, he leaps right out. But you put him in a tub of water and you just slowly increase the heat. He's going to go, whoa, I love this. This feels good. And then boom, it's too late for him. Um, and so I think that they'll, they'll do is the boil, boiling frog uh, uh, kind of approach. You've already... Just to be clear, we're the frogs in this? We're story. the frogs. Okay. We're okay. The just, frogs. just wanted to know. We're the frogs. Um, and, um, and you've already begun to see some hints um, of, of this. Um, I had an investigation underway um, that... Um, so after we approved AT&T acquiring DirecTV, I wish I'd been prescient and had seen this coming. I wasn't smart enough, I guess. But AT&T Mobility, their wireless operation, started saying, well, you know, we'll deliver direct TV without charging you uh, data rates. 
a new product called Direct TV Now. And, um, and the, um, you think, wow, that's really great. I get, I'm getting free TV and not having to pay data rates. Well, the problem is that anybody else who wants to offer a, a similar service, you have to pay data rates for them. So if you're a Dish subscriber using Sling, their equivalent, you know, you're out of luck. And um, I thought that this was very similar to how, how uh, uh, John Rockefeller, uh, John D. Rockefeller, began to monopolize the, um, the oil industry uh, back at the turn of the 20th century, where, where he would cut deals with the railroads, the network of the time, um, to give him favored treatment. And I'm saying, I'm sitting here watching this all over again. And what's the impact of this? The impact of this is that somebody who wants to, to offer a competitive service is getting screwed. So I started an investigation on, on this with the goal of eventually shutting it down as a violation of the open internet. Unfortunately, we had the events of November uh, 2016, and, um, and um, uh, we weren't able to, uh, to complete that. Um, and my successor uh, immediately came in and shut that down. And so AT&T has now announced that they are going to have what they call a sponsored data plan, um, which is, to your point, about how would you use uh, the absence of net neutrality where they're saying, well, you know, maybe Netflix wants to come and pay me to, uh, to sponsor data and I'll then deliver it for free, quote unquote, to the consumer, but I'm making money over here on the other side. And I just don't think that that's the way a competitive market works. Um, and that's, so that's the kind of concerns I have. Question right there. Hi, I'm Michaela. I'm a way um, fellow for this semester also. Hi, Michaela. Hi. So um, this question is kind of in response to the mass social media movement that we saw in primarily December. So as someone who used to be a lobbyist and is kind of experienced in this field, do you see these mass social movements on social media as effective forms of lobbying? You bet. Um, the... Uh, for good and for ill, you know, as we saw with um, with what the Russians did uh, to use social media during the election, um, that uh, that platform uh, can cut both ways. But uh, yeah, I thought it was wonderful, particularly what the what the Parkland kids have done and and how the this, you know, we talk about the impact. I was saying before that the internet's the most important network of the 21st century. And, um, and, and, and I doubt you could have had the Parkland experience absent the ability to, everyone has a voice. I mean, the power of the internet is that everybody has the same voice as the New York Times. So that's interesting, um, and this is a great example of um, how on the one place, on the one hand, you, you described this as, uh, you used the word competition, and it's a marketplace, and we think of those as kind of organic, right? In, in the abstract, they just emerge. Uh, and yet, this is a, a regulatory body that we're talking about here with the FCC, and you're talking about the public interest benefits of this, this network. Um, and so the Parkland example is a great, uh, there's, a, there's a clear public interest benefit that comes from this, and it's not just the amalgam of individuals making transactions in a marketplace. Yeah. So I know a lot of the debate in the FCC around net neutrality is, is the internet a public utility or is it a marketplace? Right. Uh, and so which is it? Uh, or is it somewhere in between? Yeah. And I know the rules are nuanced, so educate us a little bit about that distinction. So we declared the internet to be a common carrier. 
And a common carrier is what the telephone company is. That, uh, that it's first come, first served, non-discriminatory access for anybody to get on the network. It's how the, net, the internet started, as a matter of fact, because the telephone company couldn't say to these crazy guys who were hooking up modems, no, you can't do that on our network. Um, so they're a common carrier. Everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people, particularly in the media who were looking for shorthand descriptions, wanted to say, oh, that means it's a utility. I don't think it's, uh, I think that there is a difference between common carriage and utility. Um, water is a utility, mm -hmm. okay? Um, but you don't have a situation where you're, well, we're going to get water from here or water from there, or you're going to get your choice. It's a, it's a different kind of, of a structure. And, uh, and so what I think uh, we're, we're dealing with here is, is, yes, as I say, a common carrier, and the requirement that there be, and I used to always preface this remark by saying, and I went to the Ohio State <laughs> University, and therefore, I always think in football terms. But there needs to be a referee on the field uh -huh. to throw the flag when something inappropriate is being done. And you get there not by having a utility, but by having the, 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 the regulatory precepts of a common carrier and somebody with the ability to look at those decisions and say, is this just and reasonable, which is the legislative test, which is the legal test. Is this a just and reasonable act? And if it isn't, throw the flag. And so this is what we read in the news as light touch regulation as opposed to the more heavy handed of setting prices and dictating what investments have to be made. Correct, although one of the things that we did was we left in place the ability to, if necessary, come in and do something about prices. Um, I don't think that, um, that at this point in time we needed to regulate the prices per se. Mm -hmm. But if, in fact, um, you know, monopolies act like monopolies, then one of the traditional effects is pricing, and you ought to have uh, standby authority to say, to, to, to blow the whistle, <laughs> throw the flag, and say, no. Great. I want to come back to the monopoly question, but are there, are there other question right here? If you took net neutrality away and didn't make the playing field equal, I want your opinion on what it would be like to have maybe foreign interference and in foreign endorsements of different things on our internet. If that would alleviate the problem or make it worse. I'm not sure I understand what you mean, foreign endorsements. So, for example, during this last election, they found proof that there were, right. let's say, Facebook ads right. that were endorsed by other countries or there was things trending that were sponsored by bots on Twitter. How does that play a role, if any, in net neutrality? And by, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. But you raise an interesting question, which is um, we have always been the world leaders in establishing telecommunications policy. Immediately after we enacted uh, open internet rules, uh, I was in Europe uh, meeting with the countries of the EU to help them draft their rules to follow our rules. And, um, and, and, and that is important particularly in, the, in today's world of uh, interconnected networks. And one of the th shocking things here is that there is a potential that American networks, to some extent, could wake up and realize that they're having to live under foreign rules because of the fact that they interconnect. Um, and so the fact that you are uh, deregulated does not mean you are unregulated. It just opens the door for that regulation to be done somewhere else with a different set of priorities, but because of the fact that bits don't understand 
the lines drawn on a map could end up having an effect on you. Right, so your, your history was representing the little guy versus the incumbent providers yep. in your lobbying role, and you carried that into your, your FCC role. And maybe your answer is gonna be, again, that we're all the frog in the pot and we're about to get boiled. Um, but um, who should we be rooting for in this, right? So on the one hand, you've got the AT&Ts and the Comcast and the incumbent cable providers, these big behemoths. But on the other side, on the, on the content providers, you got Facebook, you've got you've got other right. monopolists in a sense. Totally. Who, who's our champion for the little guy here? Like who who should we be rooting for? Oh, Trevor, how long do we have tonight? <laughs> <coughs> I think there are a couple of so 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 let's let's back up. Um, we we've been looking at one component of the internet ecosystem, the networks. Right. Okay. The other component is, let's call them platforms for want of a better description. The, the Facebooks, the Googles, the, the Amazons, etc. And um, there was a great line that, that, that um, Chandler, who was the great management Guru Chandler. Anyway, he talked about the, he talked about the um, the uh, period after the Civil War, in in which was a period of explosive economic mm -hmm. growth and all kinds of innovation. And he says it was ten years of competition followed by ninety years of oligopoly. <laughs> yeah, and that's kind of what we're seeing over here on the platform side. And they are being, and, 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 and it's a, there is an interesting, I was actually writing on this this afternoon, and so, so excuse me while I dive in here. There fresh, is fresh in your brain. There is, there is, um, the platform companies lobbied real hard to get open access to the networks. That's kind of a no-brainer, you can sure understand that. We want our platform to get to as many consumers as possible. I think there's an open access question over here on the platform side as well, which goes to the core of their business, just like open access goes to the core of the network business. The core of the platform business is information about you and me, which they capture every time you and I touch the network, and then hoard, mm -hmm. okay? Carnegie and Rockefeller may have built market share that dominated a market, but they then sold the product. The platform companies are building data share where they get all the information about us and they store it and they sell it again and again and again creating an asymmetry between them and others. And I think that it might make sense to begin to think about whether we ought to have open information rules. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, the EU has begun going down that road with banking. And uh, it went into, a, a rule went into place uh, January of this year in which the EU said you have to open um, um, the data that is held by financial institutions to um, anybody who wants to use that data to build a service. You still stay with your same bank, but you can have somebody comes in, offers an innovative and competitive service because they have access. And, the, and the, 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 the term of art in the technology field for that is an open API, an, an open application programming interface. And I think that open APIs are a powerful tool um, where, um, I'll make one more point and then I'll shut up. Um, I, I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago on how we needed to use open APIs. And my basic philosophy is that computer science got us into this mess 
and we need to look to computer science to get us out. And open APIs are the gateway to solving the problems that are created by bottlenecks. And we should be anti-bottleneck, whether it is a network bottleneck or a platform, or a platform bottleneck. We have time for one or two more questions. But the FCC doesn't have jurisdiction. I was about to ask that. Does the FCC do one or two more questions from the audience? Uh, if the uh, um, cable companies, everybody did so fabulously well under open, why do their, and I assume it's their representatives uh, at the commission now, why are they taking the opposite position? I'm sorry, but big, the, the, the cable companies yeah. don't like the open internet rule. They, they are not opposed, okay. No, they are opposed. Yeah, they go, they're they, opposed they have, the, they have these wonderful ad campaigns in which they say, right. we're for an open internet. But then, yeah. let me describe what an open internet is, which is a little different from the real deal. Yeah, so why is it that, that, that they did so well under open, but yet uh, the, the, the current administration is is uh, closing it down. Because the hope already, is they right? can still do better. Back to the point that I was making with Trevor about if they can charge for fast lanes and slow lanes, if they can prioritize among this piece of traffic and that piece of traffic. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, so just to, to a specific example. When we were doing our rule, um, the networks said, okay, we'll agree to no blocking of content, no throttling of content, and no paid prioritization, no fast lanes and slow lanes. But we don't like this other stuff that you're doing. We don't like this throwing the flag rule that you've got. We don't like this fact that you're leaving residual rate authority um, in there. We will agree to the others. And they had all of their allies on the Hill uh, making that case, talking about legislating and doing that. Um, and, but it was always no blocking, no throttling, no paid prioritization. If you look at what they're doing today, what they're advocating today, when they say, we're for an open internet, they say no blocking, no throttling. They don't say anything about no paid prioritization because the ability to offer fast lanes and slow lanes is a great revenue generator for them. Okay, one last question over there and then we'll... we'll. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Evan Pfeiffer. I'm one of the John Glenn Fellows as well. well Sorry to ask one more question. Um, but I, uh, I just wanted to ask just simply because it's not an area that I'm you know, really too knowledgeable about, but how soon after um, you know, a potential removal of net neutrality um, you know, in our nation would, um, would we see the negative aspects of it? Do you think it would be a very quick process or would it be kind of a slow over time? I kind think of we're situation? back to boiling the frog. Gotcha. Um, and, um, but you'll begin to see little um, uh, less obvious, um, you know, well, let's go cut the deal with this company to provide them better service or, or whatever. Remember, that, well, I'll stop there. So final question. You've got a room full of young people plotting their next moves. What's your advice and guidance to somebody in this era who's interested in, in public service? And reflect back on your coming from a, a world in which you represented private interests, but then it ultimately served the, the public interest. What, what guidance would you? you give to students? Now. Well, as I said at the, uh, the, the short answer, do it. Do it. Um, and, and you know, and, and I'm, I'm just incredibly grateful that I got an opportunity to do it. I mean, the, the, the interesting challenge <laughs> in, in my, not challenge, but the reality of my life and when I happened to be born was that um, I'm a Democrat um, and for the majority of the time that I was of age, you might say, in this town, there have been Republican administrations. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, um, so uh, 
uh, I missed an opportunity. As a matter of, one of the fascinating things, um, you know, when you when you look at, for instance, Bill Clinton's presidency, that there had been 12 years preceding him in which the next generation did not get the experience to start at the deputy assistant secretary level mm -hmm. and work their way up. Yeah. And, um, and I'm just incredibly grateful that at the end of my career, uh, President Obama had the faith in me to, yeah. uh, to, 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 to be able to do this. Um, but, you know, most of us will never serve in the military. It's just not how the world works. Um, a, a, anymore, um, and, um, and 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 public service is an important obligation. It is a it is a it is a what Woody used to call pay forward mm -hmm. kind of an opportunity, um, and so it's exciting to see a room full of people like this um, who are learning about and exploring what their future might be. Um, because um, uh, that's the responsibility of all of us. Well, I thank you for your service, uh, and I thank you for carrying the banner of The Ohio State University so proudly. Uh, and one of these days, we're going to get you back there in a formal way. But so please join me in thanking Chairman Wheeler. It's been a treat. It's been an education. Thanks, Trevor. Thanks very much. Appreciate it.